Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone. I am Shruti Agrawal, and you are watching our final episode on the series of Thought Leadership between Mr. Lamarch and Madhur Das. Yes, this is our final episode, and a beautiful closure to an extremely meaningful set of conversations that we've been having for the past seven to eight weeks. We have with us, as always, Mr. Cyril Shroff, managing partner at the firm. Please also help me welcome Dr. Simon Longstaff, executive director at the Tech Center. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on. Exactly. The topic for today's discussion is one which is at the heart of all mental modes of thinking right now. The pandemic will pass into history, but the way in which passes will shape the world it leaves behind. The question then becomes: How does one traverse business ethics in a post-COVID capital world, and how does one think about building new set of businesses? The famous leadership principle. The troops eat first. The officers eat last. Anyone exposed to military leadership practices, either personally or through the origin tell, has learned this leadership principle. It has never been more relevant or necessary. Civic and business leaders are wrestling now with the question of when to reopen. A phrase that's not sitting well with many, since they recognize we haven't really closed. Rather, we have changed. Change how how we work, how decisions are made, the world that we are in right now. There are choices perhaps to be made at every level. In triage, in times of scarcity of intensive care facilities, the most difficult ethical dilemma is: How do we choose for admission? Do we defeat the disease by minimizing the economic damage? Do we choose solidarity over hostility and global responsibility? Over inward-looking nationalism, do we seek to inherit a world which is better one post-pandemic or a worse one? And like viruses, human beings have choices. Choose well. In the next one hour with this meaningful panel, my endeavor would really be to guide business leaders who have enormous influence but are going through an unprecedented situation right now on how should they think about moving their business best move forward. With you, and perhaps in the context of the conversation today, and what truly are ethical considerations during these times, and perhaps take it further from their ethical considerations in the times. Sorry, I missed that. May I start? Thank, thank you, thank you, Fajal, and uh, I'm delighted that uh, today's concluding episode. Is on a very fascinating and meaningful subject on ethics, and I see it beyond business ethics, but uh, I think ethics in all forms of uh, decision making. And I think it's a privilege uh, for the audience uh, and for for us that we have someone of the eminence of uh, Dr. Simon Longstar, uh, who joined us from Sydney, Australia. Uh, and I regard him as uh, one of the foremost ethicists uh, and deepest thinkers on the subject anywhere in the world. So I think it's going to be a treat to uh, enjoy this conversation in the next one hour. So I'll just make a few brief introductory remarks and then we we'll move on with the conversation. So I think first of all, uh, we need to understand that ethics are not a luxury good, but they are actually a necessity, and they lie at the heart of decisions. Especially with those which are made during a crisis, because they are critical both for the current existential uh, issues, but also the end-to-end decisions that will be taken for a long time, which will have impact over a long time. So, Dr. Hatya Sen also reminds us in his uh, in his book that business and ethics are not binary opposites, but in fact they are close friends. Business ethics. Also have economic interests. Even Adam Smith, uh, who one can regard as a kind of epitome of self-seeking capitalism, but also said that humanity, justice, generosity, and public spirit are the most useful qualities to others. Professor Sen also reminds us that on businesses behaving ethically, and particularly, I think very crucial in a developing country. So that trust is developed, developed between the private sector and the state, 
between stakeholders and employees, between corporates and customers, and then the whole ecosystem as well. So it's probably even more important in a country like India. I believe that several decisions which we take, we kind of go with the label of administrative or policy or sometimes even political decisions are actually deeply ethical decisions. And even for businesses, some of the choices that and we will discuss this shortly, which seem like financial decisions or business survival decisions are actually ethical choices. Each decision, whether individual or taken at a corporate level, has far-reaching implications for everyone else. Sometimes even decisions which appear to be purely medical uh, are actually ethical. For example, something as simple as wearing a mask. One may, at a, at a superficial level, think it's about protecting this oneself, but it is also an ethical decision about protecting the people around you. Something as simple like that. And there are many, many such examples. We are in the land of uh, the Bhagavad Gita, so I must quote uh, a quote from it. And in chapter 18, uh, the Gita gives us a guide, telling us that actions taken without considering the consequences on others are actions taken in darkness and in ignorance. The same chapter also tells us that an action which appears to be inconvenient in the short term, but gives long-term benefits is the right action. So just now, I think whether it is the policy people are starting right down from the prime minister down to people in the corporation, even at the shop floor level, as we have to decisions, there must be an ethical framework and a set of choices and a way of process of a mindset of how we arrive at uh, some of these decisions. And I think we'll talk about this uh, very shortly, but I think this may be now a right moment for us to bring in Simon to first give a broad overview uh, on, uh, the, uh, on, on the importance of ethics uh, generally, and of course, specifically in the current environment. And then we'll dive into the three themes that we have for today, which is about ethics in a pandemic, technology jump off points and last and the most important one of the marketplace of meaning. Uh and over to you. Thank you very much, Cyril and Shreja, at your introduction. And may I just begin by uh, sending greetings to India from here in Australia. It's a considerable privilege to be invited to join you today, always to speak to people, but particularly to speak to people half a world away, um, many time zones differently. But I think there's so much that unites us, and this is one of those topics which I think is worth exploring. I really love the way that you, Shreeja, and Cyril have framed this conversation around choices and decisions. And I think at the highest order, we often fail to notice that we actually make the world around us through the choices that we exercise. It's a direct product of what we decide to do that shapes today and what future comes into existence. And ethics is really unavoidable in that space. It, it's not that uh, ethics suddenly disappears as an optional extra. Cyril said it's not an optional extra, and that's in part because it's an unavoidable component of how decisions are made. We are always driven by our core values and our principles. The trouble is that most of the time, this is happening without us consciously attending to the way we're being driven. Uh, that we'll have certain beliefs about what is good or right, and too often we may have inherited those beliefs uncritically from our family, our friends, our society. And if you're not very careful, then they can start to drive you in ways, if they're not monitored, which are more to do with their shadow forms than their, if you like, the ones that are in the light. And that's when you start to see good people doing bad things and producing bad outcomes in the world. So this part of firstly just understanding that we can't escape it, the issue is not will there be ethics, it'll be what kind of ethics do we want? What kinds of values and principles do we wish consciously to adopt? And how do we get to the point where we're not just operating as a matter of habit, but by making clear choices for the decisions we make? Now, why would we want to bother about that? Well, there's lots of philosophical arguments and Bhagavad Gita is going to give you one set of arguments and others. There's also some very practical reasons too. And it goes back to how systems work. So Adam Smith was mentioned by Cyril. He made it very clear that if you genuinely want a free market, and that is often the best kind of market to ensure the prosperity of all, then you cannot lie. You cannot cheat. You cannot use power repressively. All of those things distort the markets and they stop working. If you want to have a 
political system in which citizens are able to allow progress to unfold, then they must trust their governments. And they only trust their governments if governments are able to state that this is what they stand for and therefore act in a manner that's consistent. Otherwise, people say, well, you say one thing, but you do something else, and trust is eroded. And I think the most interesting thing is that what this means for economics. So we're going to be publishing probably in about two months' time a piece of work which we've commissioned from Australia's leading econometricians and more an economics consulting firm, looking at just what value a healthy ethical infrastructure provides for an economy. So I don't want to say it's just about the economy, but this is something which is worth noting. And we think that the results are going to be very compelling, that it's not just something which speaks to one's heart. There are actually reasons for the head in terms of economic performance to really get this right. And I suspect what's true for Australia is very likely to be true for India as well. And there's no doubt the figures we're seeing in the early stage show that it's better physical health, better mental health, better job prospects and better GDP all linked to getting this right. So maybe that just sets a framework for it. A, that it's unavoidable. B, that it's about the choices we make and the world we create. And C, if you like, that this has very profound practical implications, including for things like economies. Well said, unlike viruses, human beings have choices and we need to choose well. Uh, Mr. Shaw, I sort of come to you now that, you know, how does this ethics conversation really sort of coming up in the times of pandemic, you know, how really has that changed since prior to pandemic? Of course, there are concerns being raised on, you know, the post-lockdown scenario, livelihoods will change. A lot of things will actually be talking about rebooting of the new world order. Different motivations are coming to the fore. Once in the Silicon Valley world is seeing it as you know, the rebooting of a new renaissance, the VC world, for instance, because the future of work, future of how we congregate, future of technology, everything's going to change. So I want to understand that, you know, how do we sort of embed, you know, ethics in part of almost every day what we do? And how can that just become a natural way to live by? What do you think? So uh, I'd like to make it a little practical. And as we talk about the ethics in the pandemic, Let's talk about a few live situations and actually have a conversation uh, between Simon uh, and myself and, and explore what some of this actually means. And let's start with some simple things. Firstly, let's just talk about the ethics of, say, the lock, lockdown and reopening the economy. It involves trade-offs. It's the lives versus livelihoods uh, discussion. And at one level, it may seem like a political discussion. Uh, or a political choice, but it is actually an ethical uh, choice as well. Because you have to really weigh off the implications uh, on on health of thousands of people versus also the livelihoods of thousands of people. And how do you actually rationalize the thought process in your mind of how do you arrive at, uh, arrive at that conclusion? And I think all corporates uh, in the country, all policymakers are grappling with this, not only in India, but also in Australia. And I know for a fact that Simon has been advising a number of global boards on this as well. So, uh, Simon, what's your uh, what's your thought on this? And then we take a number of practical examples because it's probably the best way to illustrate the point. Well, I think, I think, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing to realise is that there's not actually a strict symmetry between the two options we have around preserving life and preserving jobs or even life when it's associated with economic decline. And the reason for that is this, when it comes to COVID-19, the disease caused by the virus, there is no vaccine, there is no measure available to humanity to prevent people from becoming infected and particularly to preserve the lives of the aged and others who are susceptible to the infection, other than to bring about a certain amount of isolation and quarantine. That's where we are at the moment. On the other hand, when it comes to preserving the economy, there are a whole range of different measures that you can put in place that offset the damaging economic effects of a lockdown. And they range from quantitative easing, which you've seen some central banks doing, through to investment in infrastructure, particularly what we would call in this country shovel-ready infrastructure, those things that create jobs, through to uh, economic stimulus from government funding and, and things of that kind. So, You've got two different types of problems sitting alongside each other. 
one, the preservation of life, which has only one solution, and then you've got something to do with the economy and things of that kind where there are multiple interventions which you could bring to bear if you made certain decisions as a policymaker. And I think that's until we change the situation, until there's a vaccine, for example, that's where we're at. And so we have to ask ourselves as citizens in a society, are we prepared, therefore, to see our politicians and others in leadership roles take account of that, knowing that there will be a cost that we will all bear for the preservation of life, given that's our only option, if those lives matter. And so in the end, you start to come down to that very fundamental question. And of course, from an ethical perspective, you cannot avoid asking yourself at some point, well, what if it was my life? Or what if it was my mother's life or my father's life or someone close to me, uh, let alone those of strangers? And of course, you begin to say, you, if it, as soon as you personalise it to that degree, you begin to say, well, of course, I would have some sympathy. So a kind of moral imagination is called upon to bear in that way. And so this is what we've been looking at here. We've been saying, well, we knew we had to make decisions to preserve life, but not to be indifferent to the economic consequences, but to use the other machinery that we have available to us as decision makers to offset as far as possible the losses that might otherwise flow from that decision. Uh, if I can sort of change gear a bit, and let's talk about something which is a bit corporate, which is the redundancy decision. Uh, and this is about the choices that uh, many businesses and corporates will inevitably have to make in terms of letting some people go. And uh, again, it's a, uh, uh, it's a one level is a financial decision, but at the other level, it's, a, it's an ethical decision. And it comes down to really whether you know you need to let a few go in order to save the rest uh, as well. I think that it comes down to that kind of trade off. But and once it's almost inevitable for most businesses to take some decision like this. Some guide us in terms of how can this decision be done ethically? How does a decision which has a harsher in and some become ethically right? And is there a process element to it which kind of cleanses it uh, and makes it fall in the right box? Well, it's, it's, it's not hypothetical for me. I've had to go through it in the last two weeks where we were making redundancies at my organisation and we're a for a relatively small charity, but even one or two people, in our case it was five people, still is very much a demanding thing. So we've thought about it a lot, and as we've had to advise others too. Uh, the way that I think you've got to begin thinking about this is to recognise that you do have an obligation to preserve an organisation if it still has a reasonable purpose still to serve. I mean, if an organisation finds itself in the moment of a pandemic and it's really reached the end of its useful life, and perhaps in those circumstances, you shouldn't try to hold on to it. You should you know, accept that that moment has come. But in our case, and in the case of many businesses, they say, no, we have reasons to continue to exist. The products, the services we provide are of value. And therefore, you begin knowing that that will ultimately be the decision. And so the question is then not about whether or not you have to make yourself stormproof, if you like, to and pull in the sales a little bit, which may involve loss of jobs, but how you go about doing that. And one of the things you realise when you do it, of course, is that it's not about fairness. Uh, you, when you make people redundant, it's not because they haven't done a good job or that they're not competent or loyal. It's that the particular function they perform cannot be afforded in the economic circumstances in which you find yourself. So being honest about that, is a starting point, that you're not going to be making decisions which are based on justice because there will be some people who, by every measure, have done everything they could have done to deserve their role, but that's not possible to be sustained. And, and just saying that for a start, of course, removes from them the burden of thinking, oh, I wasn't good enough, it's my fault or something of that kind. The second thing to do is to only reduce to the level that you actually need to, but don't, I think, do so little as to make it uncertain on an ongoing basis. So you're better off making decisions now which allow for clarity for that point onwards, rather than it being, if you like, the death by the proverbial 1,000 cuts. Make a larger cut now, know that you're going to do it, do good planning, explain the reasons, be transparent with people about this. So that's all around the decision making that leads you to it. Of course, then the question is, what are your obligations to those who are going to leave? In our case, and I would recommend this for anyone, you need to do everything you possibly can to enable the person 
beyond the statutory requirements that will be there in terms of paying proper amounts to ensure that they're supported. So in, we, we, we provided psychological support. For some people, it was a terrible shock. Um, so we had that available. Outplacement support so that you can provide something that gives people a chance. And also just trying to think about ways by which you are going to enable them to be in a better position to secure a role. And of course, that raises an ongoing issue, which is that hopefully along the way you've been investing in your people so that they are more employable today than they were when they first came to join you. Now, all of that said, that doesn't remove from you the, the terrible burden of having to make that decision and for others uh, that you carry that. The one last thing I'd say about it, Cyril, is I think you've got to be prepared to tell people that you're not, when, not to answer questions just because people ask them if you're not ready to give a complete answer. Because I think too often you'll find people in leadership roles who will be pressed to offer clarity and they can't do it responsibly because they just haven't got enough information. So being honest about that and saying, look, I can't tell you now, but I will tell you. I'll keep you informed for the best I can once these things become clear. And we, uh, in the preparatory discussion, we also talked about the survival dilemma, which I found as a kind of very fascinating uh, concept of the guilt that the survivor has, of the guilt that those who are not fired or those who are not afraid of are going to carry in their hearts after you've done the, the, the redundancy. And how does that play out? And how do you make sure that that does not become a kind of toxic influence uh, in the surviving organization? which reduces its productivity. This, 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 is, the a, most this is an amazing conversation. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, this is the most important uh, insight in terms of not just the redundancy phase, but the whole of a crisis. And the analogy I think is most telling is after something like a shipwreck or a natural disaster. And there are usually three major phases then. So we know from the history of these events that when the initial emergency begins, you'll find everybody coming together. They will cooperate fully. They will bend their backs to the oars, if you like. If it's, imagine if they're in a lifeboat and they'll pull away from the scene of disaster. Then time passes and they enter the second phase where resources start to become scarce, where, for example, the water might be rising in the boat and there's not enough food and things. And we see two things happen then. One is that some people become quite selfish and they just look after themselves without any regard to the group. And other people become extremely noble. They say, look, I'm not going to survive this. I'm one extra mouth that doesn't need to be fed. Just let me slip over the side and disappear. And so these are like the people who become redundant, who in this case don't necessarily choose, although in some situations people will volunteer to reduce their hours or, or to leave. And then you reach the third phase, which is the part you're asking about, Cyril which seems to be the best moment, but is actually the most challenging. And that is when you reach survival point, when the rescue vessel arrives or you find safety. And instead of people being uplifted and celebrating their survival, instead they are highly prone to feeling guilty about their survival. And as a result of that, they begin to shut down. And they ask themselves the obvious question, why me? Why did I survive as opposed to somebody else? Um, what can I make of this moment? How can I go on given the damage that was done along the way? And that's true even of those who made the decision, who ask of themselves, how did I become that person who did these things? And it's at that moment, if you say to people, it's all right, you know, we survived, we're back, we're here. It does absolutely no good at all. It does nothing. The only thing that allows an organisation then to succeed is if you provide those who have survived with a purpose, a reason which justifies the cost, the sacrifice that they and others have made. And it can't just be a glib statement. It can't be a few words here or there. It's got to be something that they can really commit to. But there's a paradox in this then, and that is that if at that moment when you really need to have the purpose which brings people together, people listen to you and say, but that can't be true because of what we did in the past, then all of that opportunity is lost. And so the lesson in these crises is that you have to imagine the future you want to inform the decisions you make in the present. You cannot allow today's decisions to invalidate 
the future that you will need to rely on. So if you're in, for example, thinking about redundancy and your only consideration is your interests and you do it in a way which is brutal or unfeeling, you should know that as you're doing that today, you are destroying the possibility of a better future for your organisation and it simply will not perform to the level you will need it to do once the times are better. That's sort of very well said. You know, in terms of talking about redundancies, I want to understand one thing, that this tech question sort of really keeps coming to the fore, right? That tech will eat away our jobs. So the thing is that if we are getting into an economy where there will be less jobs, so to speak, because of the slowdown and technology. So it's not necessarily a tech problem, it's a distribution problem that we have. And this entire question of universal basic income keeps coming to the fore. So how does one arrive at those decisions, you know, ethically? What is the ethical framework to think through some of those life-changing decisions then? Well, I think, Treasure, what we have been seeing, one of the interesting things about COVID-19 is that I think it's given us an early taste of the future that we thought yes. was a decade away. I mean... As they say, 2030 has arrived in 2020. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, there's no doubt that technology when deployed, will have a large displacement effect in terms of many jobs. Some people will go on and become crawfatis because of it. Others will just simply lose their, their jobs. And it's not just going to be blue-collar workers. It's going to be people in law firms, accounting firms. Basically, wherever anything can be automated, it will be automated. Now, some people think this is a terrible thing. In fact, I think it's not necessarily terrible by any means. There will be many forms of back-breaking labour and boring work that people will be relieved from. I mean, I'm sure people in Cyril's firm who are engaged in discovery, for example, would say, if somebody can save me from having to go through, you know, boxes full of documents because an AI system will do it, they'll say thank you very much to the AI system. But they need to be catered for because they will go off and it's not that they will not have a meaningful life because it's possible to have a meaningful life without income, but they will, sorry, without a job, but you need income. And this is where your question trees are about the universal basic income becomes interesting. I, I actually think that one of the things, and this is only something I've been looking about a bit lately, is I think there'll be some interesting new sources of potential income, which, for example, are related to the value of data. So I've just been talking lately to people who say, well, you know, big data is the future, think of the economic value that's there. Well, at the moment, we tend to think about the use of data, for example, as a liberty right around things like privacy or uh, the right to consent and things like that. It's quite possible that in a world in which you cannot sell your labour, that what you will do is actually sell your data, your information, and that if there's a, a private uh, cloud which is being developed where you can control access to this, you will be able to make a claim to be paid for this. And I suspect that there will be a very strong political movement from people who are looking for new sources of income where they will say, my data now has value and you must, as a government, at least democracies will be susceptible to this, like India, uh, you must put in place the laws which ensure that I receive some value from that. So now we have to start thinking about how do you make sure an equitable distribution of the benefits of those things, you know, taxes raised on the means of production rather than on labour, paying for data, the other things. But as long as we think about these things in advance, then I think what you can bring about is a transition which will be both just and orderly. The trouble is we probably won't think about it until it's too late. And there's just so many issues in this to do with the, everything from the design of the technology through to the economic system itself. So we are somewhere... Um, this in, is in, a great India, way of thinking. Yeah. In India, we sort of uh, uh, started that journey, but uh, you know, there, there's still some distance to be covered. Let me now move to a medical aspect of uh, of the ethics of a pandemic and talk about something which I think in a country like India, which has so much scarcity, I think is actually quite live right now in hospital, is a triage decision that has to be taken at hospital beds, or particularly a ventilator. Is that, and, and, and I know that. Uh, Italy faced this as well, uh, as also some of the other countries are, the West are facing this. So how does uh, a doctor or a hospital take the decision ethically in terms of if there was only one ventilator and there were two patients, which one will you say? And uh, because there's no, I mean, it, it's a set of bad choices. And how does one create an ethical framework to take a decision fairly? 
if at all there is something like fairly and ethically for a decision for Cyprus? Which one will you let go? Well, as you know, this is a real decision in others. In fact, we've, we've already been talking about triage, except we didn't give it that name in relation to redundancies where you're saving a corporation, you're effectively engaged in triage. In this case, we're talking about life and death. But fortunately, there are reasonably well-established ethical frameworks for doing this, and there are also models for trying to assess, not in economic terms, but in terms of the quality, what are called quality-adjusted life years, qualities, which are used for making an assessment. Uh, and what you've got to do is you've got to avoid the temptation to think that uh, everybody can be just classified according to their belonging to a cohort, for example, you shouldn't say that just because someone is older as opposed to a younger person that they necessarily should be sacrificed because they've got fewer life years to go. Uh, you need to take into account a range of different factors, which include, for example, the number of dependents they might have, their capacity to recover from the disease that they are suffering, um, because in some cases you'll find a person who's on a ventilator and you are not actually prolonging their life, which of course is a noble aspiration, but you might be using the technology just to make them die very slowly. And even outside of a pandemic, you find that people who are called in to make decisions... Or the euthanasia decision. Well, it's not even a euthanasia decision. It's just that if you ever ask someone, do you want someone you love to die very slowly because we have technological means to make them linger, I've never met anyone who said, yes, please do that. The trouble is that too often in these decisions, no one explains that there is a difference between prolonging life and just making someone die slowly. So you take, you have to look at the person as an individual and you have to work out who then has a life in terms of the prospects for recovery, the people who depend upon them. There's a whole range of different considerations that you will take into account. And some of them may even go to issues of consent. For example, there are some people who say, should I be in a situation where I'm in need of a respirator? please take account of what we would call in Australia an advanced care directive where I say, don't resuscitate me. I will have had my full span of life and I want to go. So those people make it easy in a sense for the medical practitioners who have to make these choices. The main thing I think we have to realise though is that these ethical frameworks are very important in themselves, but also if there is clinical support provided to doctors here because the process, if you're a clinician, a doctor, a nurse or someone else, of deciding these matters on a day-by-day, -day, sometimes minute-by-minute -minute basis, is that you suffer the you know, moral fatigue and the risk of moral injury, which itself, if not prevented, gives rise to you know, the possibility of mental health injury down the track. And that's why Cyril, you and Ben are setting up the Foundation for Everyday Ethics and, and the kind of things that could be offered there where, for example, in Australia, we offer a free national health line service for people with ethics issues where people can come and Work through it so that even though they'll still have the tough decision to make, at least at the end yes. of that process, they won't be saying, if only I had asked, if only if I'd taken into account that consideration. Because all you're ever left with in these cases is the least bad answer. There's no good answer as such. And you have to accept that you'll be operating in conditions of ambiguity. And, and, and live without the model, long lasting model in your practice. Indeed. And you can do that if you're assisted with the use of these frameworks and these kinds of support services in clinical settings to understand what was reasonable for you to decide and that you did know more. And that can only happen when ethics becomes part of the mainstream conversation and yeah. not what I call the luxury group in my opening demands. Yeah, and, 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 and I don't think that it's just about technology. It's not just a technical question here. These human yeah. questions require the ethical dimension to be there to protect everybody. You know, I, 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 my favorite sort of quote these days is that, you know, as we as lawyers are sort of known as the Blackboard guys uh, in India. So uh, I, I think this, this whole situation and this whole crisis is proving that the guys in the white coats are actually more important than the guys in the black coats. Uh, particularly because the guys in the black coat can pick a side, uh, whereas uh, the guys in the white coats can't pick a side. But they have to just rely on these. Uh, ethical frameworks and, and come to the right decision. And as you rightly said, have to internalize it so that they don't live with a moral injury in, on a long-term basis. Yeah, well, because one of the other most important things in the whole of medical ethics, of course, is that they recognize the intrinsic dignity of everybody. So you don't look at a person in terms of their wealth or their status or other considerations. You begin with this being a human life that's come into your care. 
that both makes it bearable and unbearable when you make some of these difficult decisions. Absolutely. I'm going to move uh, uh, to another related topic uh, in, the, in the medical space, and something which is very live with you just now is about the ethics of extracting vaccines. So at this moment, I think mean, there's a there's a controversy going on in the Indian media about a vaccine having been kind of fast tracked, and I think every country will do it. I think even the US is doing it as well without the full uh, shebang of uh, you know clinical trials and human trials and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about the ethics of that? Because on the one hand, it's got a novel purpose is that you're trying to bring uh, bring a preventive vaccine to the uh, to the population as soon as possible, but it is untested. And how do you trade off uh, the impact of the short-term decision of fast-tracking the vaccines? Uh, and first, is it an ethical decision or not? What is it? Really? And uh, how does one justify it? Well, it, it is an ethical decision because uh, you're going to be asking doctors and nurses and others to administer this, and they have their ethical obligations not to do harm. And uh, they should; they, they're unlikely to be willing participants unless they have some general belief about it being both safe and efficacious. But what we need to do, I think, is to think, well, how do we put some boundaries around the decisions we make so that we don't deny the possibility of a rapid development and deployment of a vaccine? Not in this case, because we say, oh, well, that'll get the economy going, but particularly because where I started, it becomes the one factor that actually changes our considerations around how to deal with the pandemic and particularly the risk of contracting disease and dying in those people who are most vulnerable. And so you look, for, and so there are good ethical reasons why you would want to do it as quickly as possible, but you would look therefore to make sure that you don't sacrifice questions of safety and effectiveness by finding people who are willing to volunteer to test as early as possible those which are promising candidates. And they've got to be people who are genuinely capable of consenting. So I, I saw it just the other day, they're doing a vaccine trial. But that's at trial. the testing stage. If, if, uh, if it's actually just distributed uh, amas uh, and, and uh, sort of they're taken to market uh, prematurely in a conventional sense, I think that's where my value is. Yeah, well, that's where I think you've got I'm to be I'm not going to be the first in the line, in the first in the queue for that vaccine. Yeah, you've got to be reasonably clear that before, I think, before you release something like this, that you know that it's safe and effective. I think to to not even have that degree of assurance and to put it in the market, even if your motivation for doing it is just short-term, say, economic gain so that you can open things up, it's a very foolish decision because if it is not safe or if it is not effective, what you'll do is you'll just destroy further a whole range of things. You'll destroy economic prosperity by having to have another lockdown. You'll destroy trust in those authorities which thought to do it. You'll probably destroy value in any company that was involved because you and your black coat chaps will come looking for those who are responsible and there'll be liability issues. I think what we have to accept is that there are tensions in these moments, but there are minimum standards of safety and effectiveness that have to be assured. And we do need to have a, taste, a testing regime that allows those minimum standards to be met before we start to push things out. Because I think um, one can reasonably expect that to fail to address the underlying ethical commitments will actually produce uh, you know, counter-effective results that you would not want. Let me move to uh, a bit of more popular... Some of the technological jump offs, I think we spoke about quite a few things with ethical considerations. So, do you think mm -hmm. that is, it's a very interesting conversation? We went from vaccines to euthanasia to businesses. What do you think, Mr. Shroff? Should talk about technological jump offs now? Just one more question. I want to talk yeah. about uh, corporate debt. We talked about human debt. So, we talked about insolvency. And what are the ethical frameworks to discuss and to evaluate the ethics of a moratorium? Because what you're really doing is you're creating a zombie, uh, uh, a set of zombie companies, and you're not allowing that uh, that resource to be kind of recycled. And we had it in India, and I'm sure many countries in the world have uh, uh, imposed temporary moratorium on insolvency and have actually just postponed the inevitable, uh, which seems to be the right thing to do in the short term. And I think it sounds right, but I think there is an ethical trade-off which is not given enough. Weightage to in terms of what is the real price that you are paying 
by it's it's exactly like your example of dying slowly. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the it's the equivalent of it's the corporate equivalent of that human example. I'm glad you picked up on that because that, that's what I would have hoped, that there is actually a very interesting parallel here. Uh, you can, by various government and other measures, um, preserve or seem to be preserving the life of a corporation when in fact all you're doing is delaying the moment of its death. And there may be something in that. I mean, I do think, I mean, if you think about the human analogy, sometimes you need the family to be ready to have people to prepare. But it's a, it, beyond a certain point, it becomes a cruel thing to do. And so I think what you do is you might say, when a pandemic hits and people are not prepared, let's put in the moratorium for long enough to put in place the measures we need to have people prepared for what's going to come. And that might include various uh, other measures that governments themselves have to make to think about how the economy will adapt to this. But that point shouldn't be made to linger on forever. You, I think at that yeah. point it's an time moment because what you see is the potential risk of debt mounting up. And also um, there's a moral hazard because it creates a kind of an incentive among some borrowers at least to default. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's, that's it. You start to defray the risks to those who are totally innocent without realising that this organisation was very close to the edge. And so you need to make sure that you don't do this for longer than is required to make that transition possible. Yeah. And then hopefully have people prepared for what's going to come. And, and, and you know, if they can stave off that by rethinking what they do and recapitalising on a range of different things, fine. But otherwise, I don't think you can postpone inevitably and have people exposed, as you say, to the moral hazard of such a decision. Yeah, I think let's go to your technology one. <laughs> yeah, I think we spoke about this, you know, ethics and pandemic in quite a few areas, you know, vaccines, business, insolvency. We gave some bad examples also. You know, my question is that tech is going to be all pervasive, looks like in the looks of it, where it is, like your Facebook quite rightly mentioned that 2030 is already here. When we talk about this entire future of everything conversation, one needs to understand that with great power comes great responsibility something which tech companies perhaps not acknowledge so well. And in my conversations with this entire, you know, so-called this pervasive idea going around is this technological instrumentalism, the idea that tech is just a value neutral tool. And a lot of these experts say that there's nothing inherently good or bad about tech because about the people who use it. And the example they often give that guns don't kill people, people kill people's school of thought. But I think, do you think it's time that, you know, this kind of thinking is running out of steam and perhaps you know, technology companies need to be more ethical in how they devise their technology and there's more regulation there? I mean, I want to understand from you, Satin, on how you think about this. You're absolutely right. And the argument that technology is neutral is just completely false. In fact, what we find regularly is that it's possible with technology, and guns are a good example which I'll come back to, where you can actually design certain affordances within the technology to prevent those things that you might reasonably expect could go wrong. So, for example, a gun could be designed these days which has a hand grip which reads a fingerprint, which means that it's not possible for a stranger to pick it up unlicensed and use it for purpose. You can different purpose. You can you can build in once you understand that you have a responsibility. Uh, then you can start to design into the technology those various measures which make it appropriate to use. And so I would argue and have argued in some of our publications that if you, if you disconnect technical mastery, if it's not connected to ethical restraint, then it gives rise to all forms of tyranny where people start to do very bad things with technologies that were there. But it's not just their problem, it's also the designer's problem. So I think you now we have the capacity for technologists to ask themselves when they're designing their technology, what are the fundamental ethical principles which ought to be built in at the design point? Uh, without limiting the technology they develop, how can those principles be proven to be in place and given practical effect to a disinterested third party, say an auditor who assures that they are there? And how do you use things like blockchain to monitor the provenance of this. And we were having a conversation here in Australia on Monday about big data and the public good. 
and looking at looking at different technologies. And one of the things which we were floating was the possibility that you may even create a regulatory sand pit in which all kinds of technologies need to be tested. A bit like we were talking about with the vaccines. They've got to be safe and they've got to be effective. And unless they can be proven to be safe and effective, then they shouldn't be released into the market. That means addressing many of the different issues that you have been um, pointing out, Shreja. I mean, the fact that you can do something doesn't mean you should do it, and we need to be alive to that that fact. But um, build it in first, and then instead of holding back the technologies, we should then liberate. I'll give you just one one example that we all know uh, of how badly this can go wrong. When Monsanto first released commercial grade genetically modified organisms, they did it in a way because they failed to attend to all of the ethical questions in which they destroyed value for themselves but they also denied humanity for decades some of the beneficial effects that could have been harnessed if they'd got it right in the beginning. And I don't think we should be anti-technology, we should be pro-technology, we should be pro what it can do, but only if it is shackled with that degree of ethical restraint that is necessary to make it useful to humanity. Yeah, I want to put this entire conversation about artificial intelligence, which is really being labeled as the new electricity now, you know, AI is the new electricity. What about ethics in AI? For instance, if there's a self-autonomous driverless car and there's an accident, you know, how do you regulate that? And whether ethics question, you know, comes in with these kind of, you know, conversations there. Well, it, the, 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 the... These things, um, there's a whole range of different things in technologies, and, and we'll, we'll come back to driverless cars in a moment. Uh, AI itself, of course, uh, you've got to be very careful how you go about doing them because of the data sets on which they're trained. We've already seen many examples of algorithmic bias um, at work, particularly in places like the United States, and a number of places still are not confident enough to allow them to be exclusive decision makers because you need a human being to act as a translation. And there's a couple of different levels there. For example, AI is already more able, it's accurate in, in diagnosing a number of different forms of um, cancer than say a human pathologist, but it cannot tell you that you have cancer in the way that a human doctor can because only a human actually knows what it means to be mortal. So they can tell you something about the disease with an affinity to you as another mortal being that a machine can't replicate. On the AI issue, uh, we've been doing some work on this, some novel, novel solutions around this. Typically what happens is most people try and solve the AI, sorry, the, the automatic car problem by treating everything as a network problem, including the human beings. What they fail to do, though, in doing that is, A, they violate an important ethical principle in that human beings should never be used simply as a means as an end. They're not just tools. But also they fail to notice, for example, that there's an asymmetry between the driver or occupant of a vehicle and a pedestrian, say. So if you're a driver or an occupant of a automated vehicle, you consent when you enter that vehicle to a range of different considerations, which could include to the fact that your life may be at risk should the system behave in a way that's unexpected. The pedestrian that steps off the curb has never consented to that. So from an ethical perspective, they are already in a privileged position. And then you would say, well, okay, what's the next stage of principle you would build into an autonomous vehicle? You might say, well, first principle is protect those who've had no chance to consent to be exposed to the risk. Secondly, you might say um, protect the lives of others who might be third party um, potential victims. Uh, and the third and last consideration is protect the life of the occupants of the vehicles. And in each of those levels, you're trying to minimise damage done to the other. So it's a bit like Asimov's law of robotics. You know, you've got a series of nested principles, each of which has to be given consideration. But the point is, to get to that, you have to start not just seeing this as a network problem, but as something in which you actually acknowledge the intrinsic dignity of the humans involved and something different about their relative circumstances. And those are the sorts of conversations we need to be having, which and not just about technical solutions, but about principles that ought to inform the design of the system as a whole. So, so a couple of yes. sort of practical examples on uh, the ethics of technology which are playing out in India just now, which I want to just come to and discuss each of these. First, I just want to talk a little bit about the ethics of contact, uh, contract, sorry, contact tracing contact apps. Contact tracing apps, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and we've got our version, and I know Australia has its version as well. I think the world has taken a 
view that uh, the current uh, you know priority of public health is more important than the right to privacy and let's just talk about that uh, the next one which i want to talk about right after that is about access to justice and the ethics of uh, online courts because on the one hand you know this just keeps the you know access to justice uh, process moving on but it also has a very exclusionary effect on uh, small litigants who don't have access to technology or even practitioners who don't have access to technology and then how does one kind of justify the uh, the moral dilemmas uh, which are associated with that and the third one which i want to talk about is the ethics of working from home because what has happened is now we I mean the phrase of actually living at work and the home and the, the office are kind of new self and i think there is an ethical boundary that has collapsed there as well Uh, so let's sure. talk about each of these three very quickly. Uh, well, here we are all working at home today. Um, yeah. So, uh, look, the the contact tracing and privacy—that's a classic issue between a private good, you know, a personal good like liberty, and a public good such as public health. Uh, what one seeks to do in there is to have governments, hopefully, developing frameworks in here in these situations where they assure the public. In a way that actually can be trusted, that the data that's collected for contact tracing is used for no other purpose, and so this isn't just shouldn't be just a trust me where the, the government. Although I'm sure yeah. your government uh, may ask you to do that, it's got to be that you expose the mechanisms by which contact tracing is being undertaken to independent I think transparency. Of the answer. Yeah, absolutely, totally independent, rigorous scrutiny. By disinterested parties who've got a commitment to maximise privacy to the greatest extent, consistent with the public health outcomes that need to be brought about. But beyond that, the notion that we should do things for the public good, even if we don't particularly want to do so, is an uncontroversial proposition. We pay taxes; not many people want to do that in order to have public goods provided. We obey the law, even though it may be inconvenient to us, because that is for the public good. So the duty of the citizen. To accept some, you know, restriction on their liberty for the public good is some exceptional. In the short term, in the short term, and only to the extent that is strictly necessary for the public good to be achieved, as validated by disinterested third parties. But the, the problem, I think, in most societies and including ours, is that nobody trusts that the state will actually keep it, keep their data and their information strictly for that purpose. And, and this is the, mm, and this is the terrible cost that we pay when you have. Bad politics and bad politicians. The trust that they destroy, and we have them here. And you may have some in India too. The cost of that loss of trust is not for them. They never pay the price for it. The whole of a society pays the price for not being able to trust its politicians, and the price is paid precisely when it's most needed, which is at times like this, when you have a pandemic. And you know, it is a tragedy. Whenever there is a political system that so badly lets down its people, and we've had it here, where we're reaping some of the product of that, and I feel sorry if that's also true in India. But it's um, we ultimately we as citizens in a democracy have it in our hands to elect people who are deserving of our trust, not just claiming it, but actually trustworthy. Now your second case, Cyril, beyond that. No, just on the first one before I go to the yeah. second one. Is there a design idea in relation to how these data privacy? Oh, so sorry, these contact tracing apps uh, could be devised, which could partly mitigate the problem. Is it a design defect, or is it really a is really about political cost? It's both. I mean, I mean, firstly, I mean, you can do bad design, and you can have you know everything from where the data is stored, whether or not you have data sovereignty, um, where the, where the servers are, and all the rest, through to the way in which you have agreements within departments to, you know, for example, you want to quarantine the data, so. Is not being accessible by the police or by some other agency. There's got to be absolutely uh, strict data governance provisions put in place for this. But people won't believe it if you have an untrustworthy political class, even if you are try and reinforce the system with a disinterested and informed third party who provides assurance. Uh, and that and that's the risk, um, which is why you find in countries where there are choices. A relatively high proportion of people who say, "I just don't trust it. I'm not going to put the app and things like that," including you. Um, second case, Cyril, was uh, the online uh, online uh, online courts. justice system. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I mean, I think courts all over the world have 
have moved uh, the case for urgent matters to the online court, but it's also created a, a backlash that, you know, I'm a poor litigant, I don't have access to justice, I was struggling with it anyway, and now I'm completely excluded because I don't, I don't have a, a, a Zoom or a, a, you know, Microsoft Teams through which I can connect uh, with the court system. So justice, uh, access to justice has completely been shut down. And I think there are shades of this debate, not just for online, um, online uh, access to justice, but it could be for education as well. Only, only the rich can probably afford, yeah. uh, you know, online schools. So uh, to, take, so to take the courts fully online is what you would say in your country, mistake <laughs> hogya. Not good. It's uh, <laughs> look. It's um, <laughs> and why is it a mistake? Because because like health, like public health, justice is an essential human good, yes. and it needs to be available to everybody irrespective of their means. And I know that's a huge ask, particularly in a country as vast and diverse as India, but it's one of its central claims that the rule of law and access to justice is there. And this means that those who work within the courts, judges, advocates, clerks and others, they need to understand their obligations in the same way that doctors and nurses do. I know why they put the courts online. It's not just for reasons of efficiency. It's believed that that's a safer thing to do. But if the courts are going to operate, and the other option is to close them down for a period and have matters not decided, but if they are going to operate, those who work within the legal system need to understand they need to have a certain degree of mobility and sacrifice for the public good by which they take the risk of exposure, albeit with controls like you know, physical distancing, sanitisation and other things, so that every single person across the subcontinent has opportunities to have justice. You, you it's very difficult in such a big country of 1.2 billion yeah. people with so many, yeah. so many below the poverty line. So it's a, it's yeah. a hard one for, for India. But putting it online doesn't make it any easier. And the point is, yeah. when you know that it's hard, I mean, I suspect that there are a number of things beyond cricket, which people in India all share as an aspiration to be great at. And one of those would be justice. Uh, There's a strong, strong trend, you know, train of thought within India about justice, well before the British or anybody else turned up, you know, long, way back. Uh, Ram Raja, I mean, that's yeah, yeah, you're going to have the Upanishads and... Yeah, goes yeah. back to so, Ramayana because the, uh, the ultimate gold standard of the hmm. governance was the Ram Raja, and that's the standard to which we hold ourselves. Ashoka, uh, all, you know, there's so many different things you can yes. find. Where it's, a, it's a deep run thing within India. And so you don't want to make something which is inherently difficult because of the size and complexity of the nation even more difficult just because you use a technology. If you really are committed to digital justice, then ensure that every single citizen of India has easy access to this service, um, and that might involve innovation of its own kind. Your third case is working from home. Um, and working from home, is like it, 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 all of that. Yeah, well, um, of course, not everybody has quite the luxury that we do to be at home and have the means to do this. It's the notion of equality or inequality in, in the digital world, which we've just been touching on, extends well beyond justice to other things. Uh, but, I mean, you, you, you don't want to feel any, see anybody having their life completely dominated by their work. And there are some, this isn't to say that there should be this narrowly confined set of hours that other people work. There are some people who love their work so much that they would just do it 24 hours a day, you know, um, if they could. You know, they, that's how you're like, you know, there you are, you're one like that. Shreja, I can tell she is also yeah. absolutely passionate about her work. But we shouldn't think that uh, <laughs> the move to go back to our, our homes as we are now should be some kind of compulsion to spend more time. I think it's, about, it's as much about personal responsibility to be aware of this and for employers to make sure that they don't exploit their employees simply because that's they can on these moments. And that, that's the key. And so it's a, you think, you've got to think about this as a holistic way, really, as a system. I have obligations as an employer, my people who work for me have, and I have personal obligations in terms of my own judgments and making sure that everybody understands that is an essential component in a system that works well in these times. I want to move to the last bit now, which is, I think, the grand finale of this conversation about the marketplace of meaning. 
Mm. And uh, I think as we all know that the conversation about purpose has been going around for the last decade or so and it has picked up a lot of momentum. There's been a lot of academic uh, work on it, uh, the work of Professor Colin Myers. Also, uh, you know, a lot of the global leaders got together and signed a declaration last year. Uh, India moved from shareholder uh, uh, from, from shareholder model of governance to a stakeholder model of governance. But let's take it a little further, Simon, and I think go to the conversation we had a few days back on how are corporations finally going to be differentiated. Uh, it's at the end of the day, I think some competitors or in each in each sector are going to look roughly similar, but what they will stand out for differently is in the marketplace of meaning. So how does one construct that marketplace of meaning and what is that concept? Well, the way I think of it is as a new ecology for business. Um, and we talked briefly about purpose when in our first section and about how it can sustain people at the third stage of a crisis when survivors need to have something that they feel committed to that makes the sacrifices worthwhile. But there's something larger to this notion of purpose. I'm convinced that it is almost impossible these days to distinguish organisations by what they do. And that used to be the basis on which people would compete within an ecology of business defined by the goods that you develop, the services you deliver. Each could be made unique and you would have a special edge because others amongst your competitors would be slow to catch up. Today, that is all gone. If you are a bank in Australia, and I suspect in India, the actual goods and services that are provided are more or less identical. And if one of your competitors innovates, you can copy them within a nanosecond. And that will be true pretty much across every industry, except those that are truly developing at the cutting edge of innovation. So in that world, the only way that you can compete is to define yourself not by what you do, but by what you mean, which means having to have a clear sense of the values and principles that define your particular character within this ecosystem of meaning. And the good thing about that is it means that you don't have to be like someone else. You don't have to have this marketplace where everybody becomes bland and beige. You can think of it more like a kind of a riot of colour, Bollywood scale colour, if you like, where everybody has its, their own distinctive character and where the test is not are you like someone else, but how much are you like the thing you claim to be? Because it's about authenticity in this world. And that authenticity isn't just a fluffy concept, it's about who you recruit. It's about the systems, the policies and structures you put in place. It's about the nature of the supply chain that you bring together. It's about the quality of the leadership you have. It's about everything that you do from the face that you put to the marketplace in your brand through to the person who's on the phone answering a question or in a, I don't know, in a, in a factory or a delivery centre. And if you can build a corporation around that sense of meaning, then you will shine within your niche and you will attract capital, employees, customers, colleagues, all of these people because they'll be want to be part of that niche while others will be competing for other groups of people. And I think it's going to have radically transformative implications, particularly for recruitment, but it's something which is going to happen. And I think smart companies are on the front foot in adapting to this new ecology of meaning. I want to understand from you that you are at a time when a lot of companies, you know, look very similar from a distance. You know, all of them speak the same language that mm. we are the future, using technology in the most effective way. We want to provide the most seamless customer experience. Now, can really the meaning and purpose be the ultimate differentiator for all of them? And as an entrepreneur, how do you embed that in the design thinking, the way you think about your product, service? How do you sort of start with that then? Yeah, you're right, Shreja, and it's a pretty boring world where everybody's the same, you know, where they're all using the same buzzwords and things like that. What you've got to do is you've got to find your own narrative, which is grounded in your own distinctive values and principles, and, and the way you tell that story to those that you want to recruit. So you, in the old days, people would come in and they'd say, oh, I don't have to care about what you stand for, I just have to obey your rules, tell me what to do. I'll obey the rules, tick, 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 and I'll do my job, and that was fine. 
can't do that anymore. That's finished. You need to find people who've got an affinity with the core purpose that you've got, with your values and your principles. Not, not as clones, but as people who have, as I say, an affinity, a kind of, yes, I, I want to be part of that. Law firms are the same. You'll find Cyril's firm is different to somebody across the road. They'll have a different character because of their history, their aspirations, and you want to build upon that. And then if you're in the technology sector, it's not just about your brand. It's also about saying, what are we going to do? And what, what, what problems do we want to solve? What's our niche in that area? How do we want to do that distinctively? What are the values and principles beyond those which I think should be core to everyone that we want to bring to bear in terms of our design philosophy? And if you want to see a classic case of that from the past, the not so recent past, just look at what distinguished Apple from its competitors. It was design led by Jonathan Ives, actually built into the fabric of the technology itself. And they are distinctively, you, you can just pick it up. You know it's an Apple product the moment you pick it up pretty much because of the way that the design was developed, particularly in those early days. They stood out. That was their niche. So I think it's the same now, but it's about taking that thinking, that design thinking, but with its and recognising it has an ethical component. It's not just about the colour of something or the shape of a bezel. It's about the values and principles which then infuse everything. And that's why I say you have to have your systems, your policies, your structures, your recruitment. Everything has to be in alignment because what you want each of these organisations within this ecosystem to be is like what they claim because that's how they build trust, reduce costs and have higher performance. Wow. My last question really is about, you know, this ethics, morality and law. How are they different? Mm -hmm. But how are they similar? It looks like they're very thin lined of difference between these three one feeds into another then. They're actually a bit more different than that might suggest. Uh, they are related, but they're quite different. If, if you like, Trisha, where that line is thin, it really matters, uh, like a lot of things in life. So if we just work backwards down to the deepest level, law is an expression of what we, in codified form with enforceable provisions of things which at a deep level we think to be good and right. So. Murder is not wrong because the law says it's wrong. It's wrong because it's a violation of something deeper, such as a moral right to life. But we've decided collectively that we should give effect to that, that belief by codifying it in the law. And in that sense, the law is contingent. There could be laws that, you know, said you must or must not do almost anything. It's just the fact that humans have decided that. Now, there are some people who say, well, actually, the law can be related to some kind of deeper level of natural law, and that relates to some notion of morality. Morality, below the law, if you like, at the deeper level, is the ability to know what is good or right, so values and principles, that shape the choices you make, including the choices you make about what to enact as law. And so we pick these up. There are different moral systems. There are those um, different systems within India and outside of India, from philosophical traditions, religious traditions. There are different moralities that corporations create within their own skin for the way they will decide. And that can be taken up in a way which people apply without too much thought. And then you get to the deepest and the most profound level, and that is ethics. And the difference between ethics and morality in they both have values and principles, is that in ethics, it is by definition about living an examined life. It begins by recognising that although we may belong to the world of animals, in part, unlike them, as far as we know, we have this ability to make conscious choices, that we can go beyond instinct or desire and to do things or not do things for conscious reasons. And so it's the enemy of the merely habitual moral life where people are habitually kind or gentle or whatever, which might sound wonderful, but ethics says there's something more that you can aspire to as a human being, and that is to live a fully human life, which is an examined life. Now, they all have their place together, but with those subtle distinctions, they really matter because at the ultimate level, it's a question about what kind of being do we participate in as human beings. Wow, what a lovely conversation. We spoke about so many things. You know, ethics has to be so much more mainstream than we sort of really envisage it to be. It has to be really, really deeply rooted in the way we think about various things. Mr. Shraw, you want to say something in concluding remarks there? We spoke about this entire marketplace of meaning concept was very beautifully made out, I felt. 
No, absolutely. And I think the right place to end was uh, what Simon sort of just said just now on you know, living the exam in life and that's from, this, from Socrates. And I know actually it's such an important concept on, on Simon's work that he has it as part of his email signature. Uh, and that uh, will be the basis of all of this. And I think this, this hierarchy of law and morality and the ultimate, uh, sort of like ultimately it's about ethics because it makes human beings unique in what they are. I think that we should leave it at that uh, and, and just think about it and take this conversation and go back and think about how humanity is navigating through this, how India is navigating through this, and how each of our organizations and us individually are navigating through this. And can we hold up uh, a, a sort of an ethical test in as many decisions as possible and to just make us more human. So that was the purpose of you know setting up this uh, conversation today, and I would not think of a, a better concluding uh, finale episode. We should make us think about these things for a long, long time. I think the number of questions we should take them. Shija, you're on mute. I'm just saying I'll just do my rapid fire quickly and then just take up some couple of questions. If that's fine. So my first question to you, Dr. Simon, and say like one word answers, very quick answers. One word to describe how this pandemic will go down in history. Unforgettable. How will China go down in history? Dangerous. <laughs> that could be the one you have, one, one word answer as well. Future of technology in one word. Say again? Future of technology. Brilliant. Advice to Silicon Valley internet economy builders. Begin with the ethics. What will define leadership of the future? Moral courage. One thing you love about your fellow speaker, Cyril Shaw. Uh, there's two things. His sense of humour and his excellent food. <laughs> <laughs> Best vegetarian food I've ever had. <laughs> Humans, a mainstream reality by 2021. Say again? Bots co-working with humans. Is it a mainstream reality by 2021? Yes. Okay. And Facebook, Google, Amazon, whom should be worried about the most? All of them. Okay, Mr. Shroff, I come to you now. One show that Mr. Shroff has been binge watching through the lockdown, what is that? Uh, many actually, uh, a lot of Netflix shows. <laughs> if you were to put together your lockdown experiences in a book, what would you title it as? Transformational. A transformational experience. Okay, and how will this pandemic go down in history? Profound. Okay, now I think it's time to take questions from the audiences because you have anyways showered praises to Dr. Simon. How do you think about this? I'm asking you that question. Okay, uh, there is one question on... Um, it's... Um, quite, a, quite a few questions, I think seven or eight questions. Yeah. Are people born with good ethics due to family values followed? Or good ethics can be achieved through learning courses done by various companies for the employees? It's a very broad oh, question. There's, there's a lot of debate about this. I, I, my own view is that people are born um, with an inclination towards the good, uh, which comes from their family. But I think a lot of people um, do grow up with their, their family or community values, but they develop quite uncritical attitude to it. So when you ask people, why are you doing what you're doing? The most common response is, oh, yeah, everybody does it like that. Well, that's just the way it's always been done. And so I think you do need to learn to think for yourself, even if having done so, you return to those values and principles of your community or family, but you make them your own. Now, that can be done in part within a corporate setting. And that's because within a corporate setting, you can awaken in people a curiosity about their values and their principles and how they relate to those of the place where they work. And in doing so, you can develop a greater maturity in your understanding and also a better capacity for decision-making, which as we've been exploring is ultimately what ethics is about. 
my view on that Trija, is that I think with the first the family and the community that you sort of live in and grow up with has an influence. But finally, it's about uh, your your own kind of personal integration. So because you can have uh, sort of you know two siblings in the same family who turn out completely differently, and then you wonder which one you know if one was more sort of ethical and more thoughtful and more philosophical, what made that difference? <coughs> so it is it is personal. You must know my family. Another interesting question on. Uh, yeah. Deconstruct post humanism for us. How do we build products and ideas thinking on those lines? Post humanism. Well, I don't. And I'd, I'd be interested in the question of exactly what they mean by post humanism, but I think they're talking about a, a world in which humans are. Less, Machines are um, together. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what it is, although post-humanism could have a, another very specific meaning. I don't think we're going to go to that world. I think what, uh, if you think about technology, what it typically does is that it, it disappears into the background. So a lot of people, for example, will know that in some parts of the community where they're still depending very much upon, you know, energy sources, you know, whether it's cow pats or coal or wood or something for light and things like that. Others of us can walk into a house and we just turn on a switch and the electric light or the heating or whatever comes on or the fan. And we don't see all of the things that are behind. Uh, we don't see the wires. We don't see the power stations and things like that. And so technologies tend to recede. And I think that technology's direction will continue to be like that, where it moves into the background and human beings are thereby liberated to do more of the things which are distinctively part of our lives. And that's why I think thinking about a meaningful life without it necessarily being attached to a job becomes such an important thing because so much of the job-like activities in which we engage will be done by machines, at least at the most fundamental level. What they won't do is create uniquely human moments, whether they are pieces of creativity, which could go from design and decoration through to the kind of care we can give for each other. And so I see the, if, in fact, we'll need to make sure we do this, that there's a real opportunity with the technology to liberate our humanity, for us to become more human, if you like, and less machine-like. And I think many of us know the that sort of scene of the human being in the factory where they look like they have become part of the machine. And there's a risk that we could do that again with modern technology where we make the human being part of the network, but I really hope that we don't do that, that we exercise enough wisdom to be able to restrain ourselves from taking that direction, no matter how much it might seem to make us efficient, and instead embrace all that it has to offer to realise our humanity in a better form. Okay, last question. I think, Mr. Shroff, that's sort of relevant for you. Uh, what legal form should ethics and technology take? Regulation, antitrust to avoid loss, lead to monopolies, some other form of stewardship of data use? I think the answer will have to come with a combination of regulation, uh, ethical design thinking, and of course, uh, sort of self realization. Uh, in corporations, big corporations, and they need to really think about this notion of marketplace of meaning, what they stand for, because as I think Simon said at the end, most key competitors in each sector are going to look very similar, and they won't be differentiated from what they do, but what they mean. So uh, legal form, of course, is important because it lays down certain boundary conditions, and it allows society to enforce I think the problem with just ethics as a standalone concept is that society is unable to enforce it. It can vote with its feet or it can criticize in a democracy, but it finds it difficult to enforce. So you do need a combination of all of this, particularly for regulate, uh, regulating the sort of feature of technology. We can't just let it run by. I don't know, Simon, what do you see? Okay, um, there, there are a number of different um, legal problems, if you like, rolled into that question. Uh, so I, I'm quite keen on, my general answer would be, let's get the principles right first. Let's work out what it is that we're trying to do. So what are the goods we're trying to secure or 
things we're trying to protect ourselves from. Get really clear about that and then let that define the tools that we have within the bounds of what's possible because let's face it, uh, we could sit around now talking about what we think is a good model for regulating um, through law, regulation and other means, uh, all sorts of things. But the political realities are that there'd be interests, vested interests that would not let that happen or that would resist or there'd be a whole range of things. And so for me, I would also hope that rather than us thinking that the only way to secure the goods and to minimise the disadvantages through formal mechanisms like regulation, let's talk to industry and let's see whether or not we can actually get them voluntarily to embrace better practices so that they make as much room as possible for innovation, still with these principles there, which they've put in place, with market mechanisms for monitoring that through assurance, but not think that we have to secure ourselves against them by government, but rather have them demonstrably ethical in the way they approach their activities. For example, the right to privacy, I mean, the right to make sure that finally there is a human being in control and man mm. is controlling machine and not machine controlling man. Mm. I think we will get some of our fundamental rights. Mm. Thank you, gentlemen. That was such a meaningful conversation. We unraveled, you know, various thinking lines, and it was so beautiful to dive into such concepts like marketplace of meaning, the live examples of ethics in pandemic, and how this conversation needs to get much more mainstream than what it truly is. I think you will definitely miss our Saturday at 11 with this entire 40 day discussion with Srila Mashi Mandagas, who is coming to a beautiful closure today. Thank you, Dr. Simon Longstop. It was wonderful having you. It's sheer pleasure and privilege to be hosting you. And I would say that please do stay safe. We'll thank you. See you next. Goodbye and good luck. And thank you to all our audiences for all your lovely comments that are pouring in at Zoom and we're getting this huge feedback. Please keep them coming. Please, I will see you next. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you.